All right, open your Bibles here tonight to Acts chapter 28. I'm looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. And um, <clears throat> if you want a simple outline of the book of Acts, um, the Savior goes up, the Spirit comes down, the saints go out. Line for the book of Acts. That works. And, uh, and we have here the saints going out. Now, the book of Acts here uh, <clears throat> starts in... Uh, in the beginning of the church age, and now we've seen the gospel moving all the way across the Roman Empire and to where now Paul is heading to Rome uh, to preach the gospel there because God said he was going to Rome, and uh, he's on his way in this passage here. And um, we'll pick up our reading here tonight um, in verse 11. After three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. Now, that's Alexandria Egypt, and um, Rome often got its, its grain from Egypt. Now, what did the Nile River do every year? It would what? Flood. And that, that fertile land, they grew a lot of um, food there, and, and Rome would come and, and load their ships up, take the grain, and take it back to Rome. With this ship of Alexander coming back with this grain um, from Alexandria in Egypt, which had wintered in the Isle, and its sign was Castor and Pollux. Now, in there, um, that was the twin sons of Zeus, who were the guardian of the seafaring men. And so what they do, they put these two twins, uh, Castor and Felix, on the bow of their boat, two heads like this. And a lot of Roman ships had that because that was the guardian of the, of the seamen. And they wanted to, um, you know, have uh, their protection well, the reality of it is, who was Paul's protector? God was. It wasn't Castor and Pollux or the twin sons of Zeus. Uh, yes, God Almighty. And, you know, Paul, he lived in this Roman culture with these idols and all the Greek mythology and all these things. But it never took him away from the truth of the gospel. And, you know, the ship, and it's kind of interesting. Luke gives all these little details here and very methodical details here. And landing in Syracuse, uh, that was from, Al from where they were there, uh, an island of uh, Melita, and to Syracuse, that was about 80 miles. From thence, we, we fetched a compass, a circle, came around to Reginium. Uh, that's another 70 miles. And after one day, the south winds blew. Uh, now, this is the climate's changed here, and before when uh, this whole year of colliding hit, the storms, see, they, they need that south wind to, to shoot the boats north toward Italy there. And um, that south wind blew softly, and the climates was right now, and they could sail. Verse 14, when we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. So as they are traveling here, they stopped at Reglium, found believers. And Paul and the believers wanted to stay together. Believers asked, and the centurion said, okay, we can do this thing. So they stayed seven days with believers. And that was an encouragement to Paul as they went their way toward Rome. Verse 15, from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and the three taverns whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. In other words, they somehow heard he was coming and they came um, south as he was traveling north and, and met him. And there was an encouragement to Paul. These believers, uh, these brethren came to encourage Paul. Now, do you think Paul could have had um, an overwhelming time at this point? You know what I'm saying? Could he have had a lot of just internal stress and pressure and troubles and just, just the wear of life on him? And, and as he probably is processing the storm and shipwreck and all these things, and he's a prisoner and chained and what's going to happen at Rome, God sends some believers. Said, Paul, I haven't forgot about you. And uh, God sends some believers to encourage him. And you ought to give thanks, just like Paul. Did. <laughs> Thank God. You know, if you're having a tough day and a believer gives you a call or you get a note in the mail or somebody just stops by to say hi to you to encourage you, that'll be a blessing to you. And you ought to thank God for the little ways that God encourages us in our pilgrimage. Because Paul's had a rough ride here, and, uh, but God's faithful. Well, verse 16, when they came to Rome and... Um, from three taverns to Rome, that was another 125 miles to get to Rome there. 
The centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. I bet that centurion was glad to get this ride over with. <laughs> I'm in a tough road all the way from there to here. And he was like, whoa, I don't know if I want to do that again. But he was there safely and uh, delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was allowed to dwell by himself with a soldier that guarded him, kept him. Came to pass after three days, Paul called for the chief of the Jews together. Now, what hit you about this verse? I'm just saying, what hit you about the three days there? He just gets in Rome, and three days later, what, what, what hit you about that? He didn't let any grass grow under his shoes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or dust settle on his feet. He was, he was on the move. I mean, just, he just gets in, all of a sudden he's going to jump right into sharing the gospel, wanting to reach out to the Jewish people. Um, how much does Paul love the Jewish people? What did he say in Romans? How much does he love them? Anybody remember what Paul said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about Romans 10.1? Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be what? Saved. Man, three days, he's ready to go. You know, I mean, I think if we've been all through, he's been through, you might want to kick back for a week or two weeks, just take a little break here. And, uh, but no, he was, his heart's desire and prayer to God is that they might be saved. Now, Paul had a little, now, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Why could not Paul switch that around? Why couldn't he go to the Gentiles first and then to the Jewish people? Why couldn't he go it the other way around? Yes, he, that, that, he did that. Yes, that's exactly yeah, in Romans. That's exactly right, to the Jews first. But how did Jewish, Jewish people feel about Gentiles? They were unclean. They don't know the law. They're cursed people. So if Paul went over to this group and started reaching out to the Gentiles first and then came back to the Jews, how would the Jews react? They wouldn't, they wouldn't want to hear him. So what he did was he started with the Jewish people first. And then ministered them as far as he could. When he couldn't go any further, then he turned to the Gentiles. So there's some real wisdom and strategy there. And we have to approach people from that perspective that there's a culture, there's an understanding. And uh, to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might, what, win the more. And to, uh, so Paul was wanting to reach the Jewish people. So that's who he calls here. Now, let's read 17, and we'll pick this apart here a little bit. It came to pass after three days, Paul called for the chief or the, uh, the elders, the leaders of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing. Now, when he's speaking to them, how is he standing when he's speaking to them? He's got a chain with a guard right beside him. They're chained together. So, so they're looking at somebody that looks like a criminal. Okay, And he said to them, Men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, Jewish people, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, now, now think for a minute. Okay, he's standing there chained to a Roman soldier. Jews are accusing him, but who is his audience right before him? The Jews. So he had to be careful here because if he showed animosity or hatred or resentments to these Jews, how might the other Jews might react? So how, look how he handled it here. He said, Though I've committed nothing against the people or custom of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Now look, look at this. Not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. 
you see how he just turned it and, and softened it out there at the end so they wouldn't get any resentment toward him that you Jewish people, look what you did to me. You know, I'm chained to this Roman God and do anything wrong. See, what he had to do, he had to keep their, their ear open to him. And so very carefully, he, he, he just says, I'm an innocent man. All he was doing was he didn't make any accusations. He just was defending himself. He, was, he didn't accuse anybody of anything. He just said, he just presented his defense. And um, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. Now, what kind of spirit is that speaking through him right there? Patience, forgiveness. He's not bitter. Do you sense any bitterness in there? I don't see that. He was very, you know, he didn't have any resentment or bitterness for all that he's been through at this point. And um, so after he gets past that point, he says, For this cause, therefore, I've called for you to see you and speak to you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Now, what, what is the hope of Israel? What is the hope of Israel right there? What is that referring to? Okay. Um, yes, in, in, a, in a certain sense, but it's a resurrection. The resurrection was what he spoke to earlier uh, in chapter 26 about the hope of Israel. Why should it be, think incredible that God should raise the dead in verse 8 of chapter 26? And because um, um, just, just before that, for the hope's sake... Um, yeah, so that hope of Israel is the resurrection. And of course, that's found in Christ, like Dan's saying. Yes, yeah, the hope of the resurrection in Christ, the hope of Israel, which I'm bound with this chain. And they said to him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee or any evil of thee. Now, think this through for a minute. What was the last ship leaving Jerusalem? Whose ship was that? That was his because it was such bad weather. Nobody else was sailing. So if he was the last to leave, and who do you think probably one of the first ones that got there was? His ship. You know what I'm saying? So he was the last to leave and the first to get there, so there was no other communication. Now, because of that, what did it do? What did that do for his situation here? Because they said, well, we haven't heard anything concerning thee. In other words, their minds wasn't prejudiced. Their minds weren't influenced. Their minds weren't anything evil against him. We haven't heard anything. Nobody said anything bad about you. I haven't gotten any letters or anything concerning you that showed thee or spake harm of thee. But we desire to hear thee. Oh, I bet Paul just said, whoa, praise the Lord. You know, he, he spent all those months traveling and waiting. And all of a sudden they say to him, hey, we desire to hear thee. What well, think of, of concerning the sect, for we know that everywhere it is spoken against. You know, he probably gave thanks to God that night because if letters had gotten there before him, it may have prejudiced their minds and closed the door. But because he was the last to leave and the first to get there, well, we haven't heard anything. Um, do all things work together for good to them that love God? Can you see how God was working in this situation for Paul? He had an audience there in Rome among the Jewish leaders of the synagogues. So they appointed a day, verse 23, and there came many to him in his lodging, whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both of the law of Moses, out of the prophets, from morning till evening. The Old Testament, Isaiah 53, all these scriptures, Daniel, about Jesus Christ, Messiah, from morning till evening. Hey, talking about a Bible conference. I'd like to have Paul for your speaker at your Bible conference. Wouldn't that be a great Bible conference? And the Apostle Paul, there, hey, they were getting it. And uh, morning till evening. And some believe the things which he were spoken, and some believe not. Is verse 24 still true today? It's still true today. Some believe, and some don't believe. And, uh, you know, he probably got down the end of the evening, poured out his heart all day long. And um, verse 25, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken this one word. It goes back to Isaiah chapter 6. Well spake the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing, ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing, ye shall see and not perceive. Um, 
Why do people's hearts grow dull spiritually? Does it just happen? Does, it, does dullness just sneak up on you and grab you? Or does something happen inside of you? Why do, why do people get dull spiritually? Oftentimes it's the attitude of our hearts, how we feel about God, how we think about God. Sin and sinful attitudes can dull our conscience toward God. And um, some of these people didn't want to believe. Not that they couldn't believe. They didn't want to believe. Because if they started believing the truth, then they'd have to change their life. Men love darkness rather than what? Light for their deeds are evil. Verse 27, for the heart of this people is wax gross dullness, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Well, Paul just laid this out there. Now, is that how you win friends and influence people at the end of your meeting? Is that, is that a good way to like, bring the crowds back next week? Uh, I don't think so. But what he said, is that true? <laughs> that is absolutely true. And, um, and he told them just the way it was. Well, verse 28, he said, Be it known therefore unto you that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Jew first, the apostle to the Gentiles, the great apostle Paul, they will hear it. And when he said that, these words, the Jews departed, had great reasoning among themselves. They were talking back and forth. Oh, I agree with this. I don't agree with that. Just back and forth. Now, verse 30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. His trial never happened. Now, can anybody give me a reason why his trial didn't happen? Because the book closes here. Actually, we don't know what happened. Two years, he's waiting for a trial. What happened that maybe kept his trial from moving forward? Okay. Um, Centurion probably had, remember, uh, Agrippa had to write some charges against him. He probably had all the charges written there against Paul, whatever they were going to say. But what happened to all the paperwork? <laughs> Gone in the depths of what? The sea. So when Paul got there, there was no charges. So what they had to do was send back to Jerusalem and say, hey, I got a prisoner here. What's the charges? Well, another problem comes up here. Now, this is Rome. This is because Paul had appealed to Caesar. And um, you had to have a good case to get all the way up to Caesar. That's like going to the Supreme Court. Okay, this is the end of the road. If you're going to make a presentation, you better make it good. Did the Jews have a good case against Paul? <laughs> they didn't have a good case against him. So they were kind of in the horns of a dilemma because Roman law said you can meet your accuser what? Face to face. face, to face. They had to come there and make the charges. Well, I don't think they really wanted to stand before Caesar and accuse Paul. Because he, what are the, what are the, uh, he had Felix and Festus and Agrippa, and all of them didn't co commit him of any crime. Innocent, innocent, innocent. Three. And now you want to go to Caesar and make another accusation? Because Rome was pretty hard on people that wasted time like that in the courtroom. You, you have a case, you have a good case. So this drug on for two years because I don't think they, uh, they ever wanted to proceed with it. So many think the charges were just dropped. Boom, gone. Now, who fed Paul for those two years? Yeah. Bread and butter, 24-7. <laughs> They're taking care of their prisoner. So, do all things work together for good? Yeah. Uh, he's got room and board and got his own hired house and Roman guard. What else happened here? Tell me, Roman guard, six hours, shifts, and uh, it's four guards a day, two years. How many guards might that have been? And he's, he's preaching and teaching. I'm talking about having a captive audience. <laughs> you know, it, it, he talks, I can't remember what book in the scripture is, but I think it's uh, Philippians, that uh, the whole palace guard heard the gospel. And, uh, you know, as you stand back and look at this, you can just see how God worked all things together for good. 
two whole years in his own hired house, came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, verse 31, teaching those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And then it just kind of, where's the book act? Is that a, like a dun -dun conclusion? Or is it kind of just like floating out there? It's a continuing story. It's a, is the book of Acts still being written today, so to speak? Are we a book of Acts in some ways? Do you know what I'm saying? I think that's on purpose that Luke just like left it here and realized the church is still going forward. And I think it was intentional that God didn't bring this in for a firm landing because it's a continuation. This chapter, these... This book is still being written. Um, today, the church, God's kingdom moving forward. Um, what a man of God the Apostle Paul was. Incredible. And um, made the best of each opportunity he had to preach the gospel. Any thoughts or insights on this passage here, this chapter? To kind of bring it for a close here. Okay, if there's no thoughts, then we'll just close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for what we looked at here tonight, and thank you for the faithfulness of the Apostle Paul and the book of Acts. And Lord, we're a continuing story in the work of the Holy Spirit through the church of the living God. And Father, may we as your people realize that although we may struggle and through much tribulation, we shall enter the kingdom of God one day. And Father, thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul and all that he did to further your kingdom and your work here on earth. And Father, as faithful as he was, may each of us be faithful also, God. And this one thing we do, God, forgetting those things which are behind us and pressing forward for the kingdom of God. And I just pray, Lord, that each of us, Lord, will be continuing the book of Acts in our own lives, so to speak, that we, Lord, would be your instruments of righteousness in this dark world to bring men and women, boys and girls, to you and to please you in all we do. So, Lord, thank you for the book of Acts here and, Father, all that you've done in and through uh, this time as we studied your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.